Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the, the film, The Shawshank Redemption. There's a character in there by the name of Ellis Redding. He goes by the nickname Red. Now, Red, when he was in uh, his teens, he participated in a reckless act of violence. And so because of that, he had to spend the vast majority of his life behind bars. In fact, uh, the prime of his life he spent in the penitentiary. Uh, but after 40 years of incarceration, Red finally received his release. Uh, and, and he was ready to enjoy the freedom which he had so longed for. However, Red can't really free himself from the habit of asking permission if he can go to the bathroom or not. Red has become institutionalized and this newfound life scares him because he's grown accustomed of the structure that he had behind bars. Imprisonment was a safe place for Red. He didn't exercise any of his own decision-making skills there. Someone told him what to do, when to, when to eat, when to go to bed, where to go. He never had to exercise any decision-making while incarcerated. In fact, that was the most daunting and terrifying part of being released. It wasn't incarceration that terrified him, it was freedom that terrified him. In fact, in the movie, Red confesses that he had contemplated various ways in which he could break his parole and go back into the security of his prison cell. And he summed up his dilemma like this. He said, it is a terrible thing to live in fear. Now, they bring that to your attention because people caught up in legalism are no different than Red. They are scared to death of the freedom that grace brings them. It's much easier for them to retreat into a cell of do's and don'ts, into a cell of black and white categories. But the church, we should not protect people from those decision-making skills. We should not protect them by erecting walls of legalism. Instead, we should release people and equip them to discern godly choices for their lives. It has become a very easy thing to fall into the trap, into the temptation of legalism. In order to, quote, help people in their walk with the Lord, unquote, we will give them a list of do's and don'ts. In order to help them, we, we want to define for them what God meant in every single place in Scripture. And by legislating beyond what God commands, we steal away their joy. We steal away their joy. I heard about a young entrepreneur. He went into the city. He had heard about Hans the tailor. Hans the tailor was the greatest tailor ever. So the young man, as he went into the city, he placed an order for a new suit from Hans the tailor. And when he went to pick up his suit from Hans the tailor, he noticed that one arm was twisted this way and the other arm was twisted that, that way and a shoulder bulged out while the other one caved in. But he thought, well, this is Hans the tailor. He, he knows what he's doing. And so he managed to contort his body and finally force it into the suit. And so he left that day. He was leaving the city. So he left wearing the suit and he got on the bus. And when he got on the bus, one of the passengers on the bus asked him, well, who made your suit? Is that from Hans the tailor? To which he said, yes, yes it is. The young man said, well, I'm amazed. I knew Hans the tailor was a good tailor, but I could not believe he could fit a suit to fit your contorted body like that. <laughs> to, fit, to fit how contorted you are. He was able to do that. You know what the problem is? That's exactly what we do in the church far too often. We get some idea of what the Christian faith should look like and then we push and shove people into the most grotesque com uh, configurations until they fit in wonderfully. <laughs> but the problem with that is that's death. It is wooden legalism that destroys our soul. Legalism is easy. It's it, it just something we fall into. It's something we like. We, we like to know exactly what to do all the time. And so we fall into it. But the problem is it's destructive. Destructive for the soul. Today we're going to look at legalism and how far it can take us away 
from God in the wrong direction. How far it can move us from the path God wants us on and move us in a direction He really didn't want us to go on in the first place. In fact, we're going to look at how it can make us miss the entire point of the Christian walk itself. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 7. If not, it will also be on the screen. We're going to start in the very first part of Mark chapter 7. and We're going to read the first five verses. And it says this, One day some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of His disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. The Jews especially, the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market unless they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law asked him, Why don't your disciples follow our age-old traditions? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Now I want you to think about this text for just a moment because I think it really defines what legalism does. Legalism, legalism creates pettiness. That's what we see here in this text. Legalism is creating pettiness. These religious leaders are looking for the most minute issue so that they can self-proclaim themselves the scrutinizers of who is and who is not a good follower of God. That's what they're doing. They're looking for the most minute issue. They're, they're trying to, to take, take the, the least little problem and define it as a huge problem. Now I want you to understand this, this hand washing was not a health concern. They were not worried about removing germs from their body. It had nothing to do with that. This was not some good kind of good health uh, 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 ritual that you did to, to provide for yourself a better, healthier body. This was a way in which they could show themselves to be the practitioners of the elders' tradition. In fact, what they did was they would hold their hand up and they would pour water from their fingertips to their wrists. Then they would take their fist and they'd rub it in their hands which would make their hands once again unclean. So then they would take water and they would pour it from the wrist off the tips of their fingers. And then all of a sudden they were ceremonially clean once again. And anyone who did not do what they did, anyone who did not live up to the traditions that they had set, they were considered unclean and unfit for the kingdom of God. And by the way, apparently they felt like Jesus' disciples, and I'm sure Jesus himself was unclean and unfit for the kingdom of God. See, the difference, according to Mark Gailey, the difference between Jesus' holiness ethic and the Pharisees is this. The Pharisees refuse to touch any unclean thing, but Jesus aims to make the unclean holy. And there's a huge difference between those two things. The Pharisees didn't want to touch anything unclean, but Jesus made that which was unclean holy. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 21 through 23, it says, Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. I want you to understand that any, any, any man-made additions to God's Word creates a scenario where self-righteousness and a better-than-you attitude comes out in each and every one of us. Anytime we add to God's Word, that's where we end up. And we start deciding who is in and who is out. We start to decide who can be a Christian and who can't. What church is worthy and what's not. We begin to judge others. But Galatians 5 verse 1 says this, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Jesus wants to us to abandon all of those things. He, he wants us to experience the joy of freedom with Him, not 
the slavery of legalism. He, he wants us to understand that we need to humbly come to him so that we can find our worth in him, not to be self-confident in what we think we can do on our own. Jesus wants us to be free from this system that proclaims ourself uh, uh, the ones who are in while proclaiming others the ones who are out. And what he wants us to do is proclaim him as the one who can save. So Jesus replies to their question. Verses 6 through 13. Jesus replied, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own traditions. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God, honor your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own traditions. And this is only one example among many. Jesus goes on to pull out or proclaim or let us understand the dangers of legalism, because he says, not only does legalism create pet pettiness, according to our text we see that, but he says legalism also replaces godliness. Legalism replaces godliness. Now you have to understand what's going on here. Jesus is trying to let them see their legalism and how it is taking them farther away from God. The one they claim to serve, they're, they're moving farther away from them. In fact, they don't, they don't just pick everyone else's violation. Uh, they also disregard the very law of God. Jesus is cutting them with this, with this, with this text here. He's proclaiming to them, you, you don't understand what you're talking about. You're putting tradition over God's commands. You are making legalism the point rather than God's words the point. You are following a set of rules and making them more important than following God himself. In fact, he says, you were told to honor your parents, but you have allowed through to tradition to replace that honor with a vow made to God. And that vow made to God was really simply a way in which they could shield their money from their parents. That's what it was. They, they, they were using legalism to shield money so they didn't have to care for their own parents is what Jesus is telling them. And they don't even recognize it. Why well, can't take care of my parents? Because the money I was going to take care of you with, I, I vowed to give that to God. However, I'm going to use it for the rest of my life until I die, and then it goes to God. But, but, but right now, <laughs> I can't take care of you because this money is for the Lord and His kingdom. 1 Timothy 3, 6 through 3 says, some people may con contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meanings of words and stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they have trouble, excuse me, they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way of becoming wealthy. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. They've allowed the show to replace godliness. They've allowed the show to replace godliness. John Ortberg reflects. He says, conforming to boundary markers too often substitutes for authentic transformation. He said, the church I grew up in had its boundary markers. A prideful or resentful pastor could keep his job, but if ever the pastor was caught smoking a cigarette, he would have been fired. 
Not because anyone in the church actually thought smoking a worse sin than pride or resentment, but because smoking defined who was in our subculture and who wasn't. It was a boundary marker. He says, as I was growing up, having a quiet time became a boundary marker, a measure of spiritual growth. If someone had asked me about my spiritual life, I would immediately think, have I been having regular and lengthy quiet time? My initial thought was not, am I growing more loving toward God and toward people? Boundary markers change from culture to culture, but the dynamic remains the same. If people do not experience authentic transformation, then their faith will deteriorate into a search for the boundary markers that masquerade as evidence of a changed life. I read that and I wondered to myself, have we set up boundary markers? Have we set up things that we have allowed to define us as Christians and in so doing replaced godliness? For instance, do we ever think, well, (laughs) you can't be a good preacher if you're not wearing a coat and tie? Do we ever think to ourselves, well, you know, You can't really worship, at least not the way God wants, unless you worship this way or that way. Have we ever thought to ourselves, you know, hey, God is looking down, and so in order to please Him, I need to attend service more than serve others. We decide attendance is more important than serving others. Have we ever decided that, you know, it's it's more important to, to know God's Word than to love others? And so we put a premium on knowledge over love itself. Legalism has a way of blinding us to how legalistic we have become. It becomes, look at what I have done, rather than look at what God is doing through me. 2 Timothy 3.5 says, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Stay away from people like that. Jesus says your your legalism isn't just showing up in your pettiness. Your legalism is showing up in you just essentially disregarding the very commands of God. But Jesus goes on. 14 through 23, he says, Then Jesus called to the crowd to come to hear. All of you listen, he said, and, there, and, and try to understand. It is not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Then Jesus went into the house to get away from the crowd, and his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just used. <coughs> Don't you understand either, he asked? Can't you see that food put into your body can't defile you? Food does, uh, doesn't go into the heart but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. By this, he declares that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. Can I get an amen? Amen. Woo! Amen for that. But he goes on. (laughs) And then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. The last thing I want to look at about legalism this morning is that legalism forgets the heart of the matter. Legalism completely forgets the heart of the matter. Jesus tells us it is a heart issue, not an action issue. It is a matter of a heart rather than a matter of keeping a list of rules. The religious leaders had had turned religious practice into their religion. As long as their actions looked right to others, they were fine with that. It didn't matter at all what was going on in their heart. It didn't matter at all what they thought about, what they lusted after, what they desired. All that mattered 
was how they looked to everyone else. As long as I get to worship once a week, as long as I give a little in the plate when it goes by, as long as I watch my language most of the time, as long as I keep my sin, sins hidden and pray at meals. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount challenges this very type of thinking. In Matthew 5, 27 through 28, he says, You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus transforms things. He says it's not just what you do. It's also the motivation behind what you do. It, it is what's inside of you and what you do. It is the desires of your heart, even if you don't act on them. But if you dwell on them, that also needs to be looked at. It is a heart issue, not just an action issue. Kyle Ottoman says, imagine you're, at a, you're out on a hike on a beautiful spring day and you come to a creek, but there's something wrong with the picture. You notice that someone has dumped trash into the stream. An ugly sight. Judging by some of the empty soda cans and trash, it's all been there for quite a while. In fact, there's this ugly film on the water. You, you can't just leave it. You, you have to do something about it. So you stoop down and you begin to gather up the trash. It takes several hours before you can even begin to see a difference. It's amazing how much junk was in there. You sit back and you rest for a moment and you realize you'll have to keep returning each day until you can, to this site until you can truly clean it up. But when you come back the next day, it's as if your work had been undone. In fact, there's more trash there now than before. Somehow the garbage bred overnight. You think about the unlikelihood of someone coming in to this very spot to dump their garbage in the few hours while you were away and you realize that something smells fishy, so to speak. So you begin to follow the creek upstream. And sure enough, you come to a garbage dump that has been there for years, and it's emptying into the passing creek. Your cleaning job only opened a gap for more stuff to settle into. You could come back day after day after day, but you would never get it clean. If you want to clean the creek, it means going directly to the source and dealing with it there. And then Kyle Eidemann says this. He says the point is this. According to the Bible, your heart is the source from which your life flows. Unfortunately, we spend great amounts of time, money, and energy, even in the church, doing trash removal downstream. But real transformation begins when we travel upstream to the source of our heart. Our real battle takes place in the heart. Let me ask you, are, are you battling in the heart or are you just working on your outward appearance? Ha, have you boiled Christianity down to a checklist of things to do or is it something you want to do, desire to do, love to do? Is it I want to be at worship as much as possible or I have to go to worship? Is it I want to give as much as possible when the offering goes by? Or I have to put in a little something? Is it I want to live as Jesus did? Or is it I have to follow these rules for my life? Mark 12, verses 29 through 31 says, The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And me, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. It is a heart issue. Not just some kind of religious ritual. It is a heart issue. You should be obligated to God because you love God. You want to please God. You want to serve God. And you have given Him everything about yourself. Not because of some kind of religious ritual that you want to participate in to make yourself look good. So what are we as Christians, what are we as a church to do? Can we have no requirements? 
Are we supposed to say there are no rules, no restrictions, which we expect anyone to follow? Are we supposed to say, hey, we're not worried about what anyone does at all? The restoration movement from which the Christian church sprang out of had a couple slogans I really like. And I think they apply here. The first slogan is this, where the scripture speaks, we speak. Where the scripture is silent, we are silent. I think that's such an important script or a slogan to understand when you're looking at scripture. If God's word says it, then you do it. But if God's word doesn't say it, then <laughs> it's up to you. Well, I'm not going to speak where God's word doesn't speak. And I don't expect anyone here to do that either. But where God's word speaks, we better speak. The second one is this. In essentials, unity. In opinions, liberty. And in all things, love. I think what a great, great slogan. Where God's word says it essentially, we'll do it because we're all unified on God's word. Where it doesn't say it, we'll give you, the opinion, we'll, we'll give you your opinion and, and respect that. But over all of these things, we're going to love one another. We're going to help one another. We're going to move with one another toward what God wants us to be. As good as those two slogans are, there's actually a better place to find our answer. It's found in Jesus, and it's found in John 14, 10. And Jesus says, the words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. That's really where we need to be. God's word is what we will stand on, live by, trust in, boldly proclaim. Anything that a legalist adds, we will cut away. Because God's word is the only thing that saves and the only thing that creates us to be the godly people he wants us to be. So don't be a legalist. Just be a Christian.